his gift. Wonder fills this moment shared together. The light of peace here shines upon each face. May it bring faith to guide our journey home. Open our eyes to see that life abounds. Open hearts to welcome it to Now, if you can please rise again or remain risen. Sorry, I didn't get to that fast enough. Um, as we recite our covenant, first in English and then in Spanish. Love is the doctrine of this church. The quest for truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge and freedom, to serve humanity in fellowship, Thus do we covenant. La doctrina de esta iglesia es el amor. La busqueda de la verdad es su sacramento. Y el servicio es su oración. Vivir juntos en paz. Buscar el consumimiento en libertad. Servir a la humedad. Esto es nuestro pacto. All right. Now you may be seated. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Emerson Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Julie Borden. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm happy to be your worship associate today. Here at Emerson, we take pride in having been an active congregation here in the West San Fernando Valley for more than 65 years. We embrace the UU values of justice and inclusion for all, strive to live by our seven principles, and are committed to listening deeply to one another in community. Today we have the latest installment in our Sacred Cinema series. Breaking Away came out in 1979 and it has a unique mix of themes. While it definitely has its funny moments and its touching moments, it takes place during a painful period of the 20th century in America. And the characters' lives play out in that context. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to stand up and greet your neighbors. For those of you joining us online, you may greet each other in the chat. And during this time, if there are any joys or sorrows you would like shared with the congregation, you're invited to write them in the Book of Life behind Kevin, or um, for those of you online, in the virtual Book of Life. So let us now greet our neighbors in the spirit of welcome.
Now I have an announcement. You're invited to please come after the service to the pavilion for a short presentation by a member of Emerson's Racial Justice Ministry for an unveiling of um, a piece of art by the renowned contemporary American artist Shepard Ferry. Voting rights are human rights, so please join us for that. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome everyone again who's here both in person and online. Um, for anyone who's with us for the first or second time, I'd like to offer you a special welcome. And if you haven't already signed our guest book in the welcome area or the online guest book, um, please do. Um, we would love to meet you after the service. Our coffee hour in person takes place beyond those doors, those sliding doors. And those who are online will get a chance to chat in Zoom breakout rooms. It's good to be together this morning. Thank you so much, Julie. And welcome again. My name's Todd Covert. I'm leading worship today and uh, selected this month's uh, Sacred Cinema offering, Breaking Away. So I had the opportunity to be here with a number of you on Friday night. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here to, to speak about it. Uh, again, my name's Todd Covert. The pronouns I use are he and him. Um, this month's worship theme, and we have one every month, is play. Uh, and in agreeing to do a sacred cinema offering this month, I went first to thinking about movies that might have at least a tenuous connection to play. Um, and one that I considered was Chariots of Fire. Okay, running, religion, that seemed like a, a potential choice. But I settled on breaking away. Um, and I was attracted to it because of the cycling scene. If you saw it Friday or have watched it previously, um, it has a couple of exciting cycling scenes in it. Um, so I thought, okay, at least that's a, a hook to hang uh, on for the theme for this month. Not that we always slavishly adhere to our worship themes with these offerings. Um, but in any case, it's a movie with a lot of biking in it, a lot of cycling. And um, it also has at its heart, a father and son relationship. And so in thinking about and looking around for a story for all ages, um, and we don't have any young folks with us here in the sanctuary, perhaps we do on Zoom, um, I picked out a kind of a classic. Um, it's one of the Berenstein Bears books, and it's called The Bike Lesson. Um, and I am going to attempt to read along with the video um, which we're going to start in just a moment. Um, and this is mostly just for fun, but I'll probably return to the relationship between the father bear and the young bear in this video and the remarks about the movie later in this service. So let's play the bike lesson. Come here, small bear. Here is something you will like. Look, Ma, a brand new bike. Thanks, Dad, thanks. For me, you say? I'm going to ride it right away. Not yet, not yet, not yet, my son. First come the lessons, then the fun. How to get on is lesson one. <laughs> lesson one? Is that lesson one? Yes, that is what you should not do. So let that be a lesson to you. Yes, it was, Dad. Now I see. That was a very good lesson for me. Dad, where are you going? You showed me how. Why don't you let me ride it now? Not yet, not yet. Before you do, I've got to give you lesson two. Just watch, small bear. Just watch your pop. Lesson two is how to stop. <laughs> a very good lesson. Thank you, pop. May I ride it now that you showed me how? May I? May I ride it now? Not yet, not yet. You have more to learn. I'll have to show you how to turn. This is lesson number three. Wow, what a lesson that number three. That may be a little too hard for me. 
This is what you must never do. Now let this be a lesson to you. It surely was, Dad. Now I see that was a very good lesson for me. When I get you down, may I ride it then? May I, may I just say when? Wait, my son, you must learn some more. I have yet to teach you lesson four. When you come to a puddle, what will you do? Will you go around or ride right through? It's not so good to ride right through. You're right, Dad. I can clearly see why that lesson was good for me. When I get you out, may I ride it then? May I, Dad? Please, will you tell me when? Of course you may ride it. You can, you will. After lesson five, how to go downhill. Wow, what a lesson, that looks hard. Going downhill through a chicken yard. Dad, please tell me, will I ever get to ride it or will I just keep running beside it? Will I, will I, will I, when? Pretty soon, son, but not just yet. There is still one lesson you have to get. Lesson six is the hardest yet. To be a good rider, you really know how. You will have to learn about safety now. To be safe, small bear, when you ride a bike, you cannot just take any road you like. Before you take, uh, where that, you must know where that road is going to go. See, this is what you should not do. Let this be a lesson to you. It surely was, Dad. Now I see. That was another good lesson for me. May I ride it now? May I ride it now? After one more lesson, it will be the last. There is one more thing I teach it last. When I ride on a road, I take great pride in always riding on the right-hand side. But, Dad, are you riding on the right-hand side? I guess I know my hand, small bear. My right is here, my left is there. Or am I wrong? Could it be left hand, right hand, let me see? Left hand on the left hand side, right hand on the right hand side. <laughs> Thank you, Pop, you showed me how. But please, 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 may I ride it now? Look, Ma, now I can ride it. See, Dad had some very good lessons for me. Yeah, now listen, it makes a little fun of the father. And you know, that's kind of a, hate to say, time-honored tradition, especially in comedy. Um, and like I said, we'll come back and talk a little bit about fathers and sons and maybe a little bit about mockery later. But for right now, let's uh, do our unison affirmation for youth. If you know the hand signals, please do the hand signals. We are Unitarian Universalists, a people of open minds, loving hearts, and welcoming hands. And now it's my pleasure to um, introduce our music director, Kevin Mathy, who is going to offer a couple of, of songs today. And this is the first one, Pink Houses by John Mellencamp. <laughs> There's a black man with a black cat living in a black neighborhood. He's got an interstate running through his front yard. You know he thinks he's got it so good. And there's a woman in the kitchen cleaning up the evening slop. And he looks at her and says, hey, darling, I can remember when you could stop a clock. Oh, ain't that America for you and me? Ain't that America something to see, baby? Ain't that America home of the free, yeah? Little pink houses for you and me, yeah, yeah, you and me. There's a young man in a t-shirt listening to a rock and roll station. He's got greasy hair and a greasy smile. He says, Lord, this might be my destination. They told me when I was younger, boy, you're going to be president. But just like everything else, those old crazy dreams kind of came and went. Oh, but ain't that America for you and me? Ain't that America something to see? Ain't that America home of the breeze? Yeah. 
little pink houses for you and me, oh yeah, for you and me. Well, there are people and more people. What, what do they know? Go to work in some high rise and vacation down in the Gulf of Mexico. And there are winners and there's losers, but they ain't no big deal. Cause the people pays the thr thrills, the bills and the peels, the kills. Oh, but ain't that America for you and me? Ain't that America something to see? Ain't that America home of the free? Yeah. Little pink houses for you and me, oh yeah, for you and me. Thank you, Kevin. That was great. Um, as part of our commitment to serve our community, we share half of our offering with local organizations whose work furthers our mission. And at this time, that organization is the West Valley Food Pantry. Each month, the West Valley Food Pantry serves over 3,000 people who are food insecure, including people who are homeless, families, and elderly people living on a fixed income, providing them not only with food, but with basic necessities. They also have a mobile shower for people who don't have access to water. We're honored to have the opportunity to support the good work that they do, and the offering will now gratefully be received. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. I invite you all now to join in a spirit of prayer or meditation or simply contemplation. Please settle in, close your eyes if you'd like, find your breath. Feel yourself supported, not just by the chair or whatever else you might be seated upon, but also supported by the compassion, love, and support of those around you, here in the sanctuary, and all the love, compassion, and support that radiates out across the internet to reach those of us joining online. And in that spirit of joining, of community, let's breathe for a moment. By way of prayer, I share these words of Walt Whitman. 
I hear America singing, the varied carols I hear. Those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be, blithe and strong. The carpenter singing his as he measures his plank or beam. The mason singing his as he makes ready for work or leaves off work. The boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat. The deckhand singing on the steamboat deck. The shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench. The hatter singing as he stands. The woodcutter's song, the plowboy's on his way in the morning, or at noon intermission, or at sundown, the delicious singing of the mother, or of the young wife, or the girl sewing, washing, each singing what belongs to him or her and to none else. The day what belongs to the day, at night, the party of the young, robust, friendly, singing with their open mouths, their strong, melodious songs. Each singing what belongs to him or her and to none else. Each week in our service, we take this moment to share the joys and concerns that have been offered up, joys to enrich and gladden us, concerns, for which we may offer compassion, love, and support. In our book of life, Lucas writes, life is just right with the beach in sight, isn't it? Live to love, love to live, life is beautiful. And someone else who did not sign this writes, thinking of my daughter who was missing her last week of camp while in the hospital. Grateful, she is doing well. And in our virtual book of life, Iris Firebird writes, Missing Randy Meisner, great voice and bass player of the Eagles. Also continued prayers to my husband, Glenn, and his struggles with COPD and giant cell, um, I guess that's arthritis. Our thoughts and prayers and our appreciation of the music of Randy Meisner and his compatriots. In a moment, I'm going to ring our singing bowl. When I do, I invite you to speak aloud into the space or type into the chat on Zoom a name or occasion that you wish lifted up as we hold this community's wishes together in our embracing meditation. What is not spoken or written can still be shared. If you have a joy or concern that is too tender to speak aloud or write, hold it in your mind and in your heart, send it out, share it knowing that it is received and embraced. May we be strengthened and gladdened by the joys that have been shared. Let us use that strength to lift up and support those who are suffering. May it be so. This is an excerpt of an interview with Steve Tesich, the screenwriter of Breaking Away. The interview took place in 1992 and he passed away in 1996. 
But reading this now in 2023, it is uncanny how prophetic his ideas were. As a young immigrant from Serbia, he loved the idea of individual freedom and opportunity in America. He drew on his experience of growing up in the Midwest as an outsider for his screenplay. But events in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, such as the immediacy of the, Gulf War, the first Gulf War, showed him how idealistic Americans could be seduced by populist authoritarians who weren't afraid to lie. He said, the word freedom has become a word used without responsibility. Freedom and morality have become two completely different ideas that are no longer related. No longer is morality sought after. Rather, we seek freedom, which could mean freedom from morality or from everything. Everything that was stable has gone into non-existence. The people are looking for something new but they don't know what it is. Communism and capitalism helped one another. We got used to the idea that the other system existed. So there was an excuse available for capitalism. We cannot be better because we have to fight against communism. Now everybody knows that there is no such alibi anymore. There is nothing that is an alternative to capitalism which only preaches, if you have more, you will be better. America suddenly became an old country. It was new, the newest ones, a country which was born from an idea. Now it's not that the idea of America is not good, but that it was somehow lost. Because we were never an ideal society, there was always a dream that we would become one. The last 10 years show that we lack the strength, and the strength and spirit to accomplish that goal. When a person believes that he or she lives and works not just for himself, amazing things can be accomplished. One will have faith that it will be better for somebody after all. That faith doesn't exist here anymore. Once man can no longer find a reason for why he is free, he immediately finds a dictator to organize his life so he can acquire things and not have to reflect on as to why he is free or not free. The world knows freedom only when it lacks it. All over the world, people are looking for new dictators so they can speak about and argue for freedom again. All our history is composed of our struggle to free ourselves from someone. What is happening here? How do we behave toward our own people? How do we treat those that work, work, and work, and suddenly there is no work, and they fall and don't exist anymore? How can we say that in other countries, life is not respected? In America, nobody is afraid of fascists because they simply don't understand them. People in America were taught only to be afraid of communists. And now, when there are no communists or when those same communists have changed their hat and become something else, many people in America believe there is nothing to be afraid of anymore. Fascism appears everywhere, but nobody talks about it here. Even Hitler was considered a silly man by Americans at first. Nobody thinks about it. There is no balance. Materialism is 90% of life here. There are a very small number of people who see value in something else, and that is true not only in America. There was maybe never a balance. Nevertheless, I can imagine the balance, and if that would be accomplished, then life would be beautiful. But I don't know if that kind of a state or country has ever existed. I don't know who said it, but it goes something like this. If a person cannot be happy in an empty room, that is a symptom that he will never be happy. If you don't have that main thing you want, then you need a million others. And even that is not enough, and you want more and more, and you will still not be happy. 
The main thing is to be able to say to yourself, I am not a bad person. I am not a saint, but really I am not a bad person. If you cannot do that, then you need to have a thousand things. And now, In my little town, I grew up believing God keeps his eye on us all. And he used to lean upon me as I pledge allegiance to the wall. Lord, I recall my little town coming home after school. Riding my bike past the gates of the factories My mom doing the laundry Hanging our shirts on the dirty breeze And after it rains, there's a rainbow And all of the colors are black It's not that the colors aren't there It's just imagination they lack everything's the same back in my little town nothing but the dead dying back in my little town nothing but the dead dying back in my little town in my little town Never meant nothing, I was just my father's son. Mm. Saving my money, dreaming of glory, twitching like a finger on the trigger of a gun. Leaving nothing but the dead and dying back in my little town. Nothing but the dead and dying back in my little town. Nothing but the dead and dying back in my little town. Nothing but the dead and dying back in my little town. My little town, a small town. How did we get from there to there? So let me start by stipulating that Jason Aldean's song is inflammatory to say the very least. That it plays to an audience that has become comfortable with tactics of intimidation, racial profiling, and even outright terrorism. And that it is, of course, hypocritical in the extreme in as much as it ascribes an inherent recourse to violence on the part of its audience as a response to a supposed wave of urban carnage should it find its way to the small town of its tough guy fantasizing. 
But why does that audience exist? In my view, it's, it's, it's just too simplistic to say systemic racism and be done. Racism is a condition, not an emotion. It provides a framework for identifying a reaction growing out of a, a deep emotional need, but it's not in itself a need. The same can be said of misogyny, homo and transphobia, and other manifestations of scapegoating and othering. Setting all Dean's small town aside for now, when I listened to Paul Simon's 1970s recession era portrait of small, small town decline, it might very well be a setting to music of the milieu of our sacred cinema offering, Breaking Away, directed by Peter Yates and written by Steve Tesich, who won the Academy Award for original screenplay for the script and whose words we just heard read by Julie. The film was particularly memorable for its sports underdog triumphant climax. climax. Sorry, spoiler if you haven't seen it. But it, it is ultimately so much more than that. Simon's narrator in the song describes riding his bike past the factories. That's an image straight out of the film. The song mixes idyllic images of domestic life with a depiction of impatience and frustration in much the same way as the film balances a lighthearted portrait of coming of age with the frustrations of lost jobs and thwarted ambitions. What the film in particular, I think, teases out of its setting are the seeds of the anger grown out of what was once just discontent that now feeds the overtly racist provocations of Aldine's song decades later. At its core, Breaking Away tells the story of four young working class men in Bloomington, Indiana, passing time and thinking more about forestalling the future than planning for it. And why not? They've seen their parents struggle with the loss of industrial jobs, cutting limestone from the local quarries, and acutely feel the gulf between their prospects and those of the students at local Indiana University who derisively call them cutters, mocking the stone-cutting jobs of their fathers. Now, in the movie, it seems to me, enlists our sympathies with those men. Men like the father of the main character, Dave, who was once a cutter, but now owns a used car lot. In a brief telling moment, Dave's father slips and characterizes his current job at the used car lot as unworthy when measured against the craft required in cutting stone. In a touching and largely wordless sequence, the father visits the mill where he once worked and asks to take a turn at splitting limestone slabs alongside a former colleague. We see the care, skill, and sense of ownership to be found in this seemingly menial job. Breaking Away harkens more than a bit, I think, to the films of Frank Capra, like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, uh, which argue that small town values like neighborliness and charity are needed to balance and ground the interests of moneyed elites. When I look at movies like those and Breaking Away, and reflect on the long history of organized labor's involvement with progressive policymaking, I wonder if we haven't lost some appreciation for blue collar labor, labor and for the struggle for worth and dignity on the part of working class people as we have increasingly sorted ourselves by geography and identity. As American society has sorted itself into ever more adversarial partisan populations, our locations, most especially rural versus urban, have become markers for our moral perspectives. And increasingly so, in my view, has been our level of education. Having said that, the temptation to uh, approve of a meritocracy is enduring and strong. I want to call, together, call to mind briefly a different movie, one from Germany back in 1926, the science fiction classic, Fritz Lang's Metropolis. In one of the most iconic moments in that movie, the son of the chief executive who rules over the great futuristic city takes up the mantle of mediator to serve as a figurative heart, bridging the head, his father, and the hands, 
being the exploited masses of laborers consigned to hellish conditions in subterranean plants. It's a nice moment, a bit didactic, but it offers little more than an assumption that conditions might be made less torturous for the mostly faceless, undifferentiated mass of laborers by the ascent of the godlike CEO. Here we are, almost a century later, and the familiar cult of the CEO and the assumption that the head must organize society are, I think, fully in evidence. Are we guilty of the same unconscious assumption that the educated should serve to organize society? And unlike in Lang's film, which offers a corrective, do we feel at all engaged in a struggle to actually advance that notion? Breaking away, for its part, I think offers a more three-dimensional and nuanced perspective. A major driver of the film's action is tension between the working class protagonists and a number of college students who are positioned as almost stereotypical adversaries. The most confrontational of the protagonists, Mike, challenges one of the most athletic of the students to race him across the old limestone quarry where they swim. The student, Rod, easily outswims Mike, but Mike stubbornly refuses to concede defeat. Charging to the finish, he slams his head into the rock wall of the quarry, seriously injuring himself. In an important moment, the camera isolates Rod's reaction, and we see both evident concern for Mike's injury, but also a sense of recognition of this young man's burning drive to prove himself the equal of someone who might be taken for his better. Elsewhere in the film, the same young man, Mike, delivers one of the most telling bits of dialogue in the screenplay. Formerly the local high school's star quarterback, Mike laments the missed opportunity to compete in college and recognizes that his sense of accomplishment and recognition will never again be at that level. Others with more resources, and yes, more privilege, will outshine and implicitly diminish him. And that clearly fuels resentment and anger in him. In the reading from the interview with screenwriter Steve Tetchitz that Julie shared, it was clear that he understood how this sense of thwarted masculinity could all too easily be manipulated by unscrupulous authoritarian politicians willing to manufacture scapegoats for declining self-worth and economic prospects. Looking back to Hitler's Germany is an obvious historical instance. But it's abundantly clear that we are facing an upwelling of hostility rooted in wounded masculine pride in our own society. I think one ascribes the sort of sentiment that Jason Aldean plays to, simply to systemic racism at one's peril. Men of color are increasingly showing signs of responding favorably to authoritarian messaging from politicians promising easy restoration of lost opportunity. In a recent New York Times piece, Thomas Edsall called attention to two competing views of the dynamics of thwarted masculinity. In the view of right-wing Republican Senator Josh Hawley in a recent book, American society is engaged in a left-driven prospect to reject historically dominant expectations of masculine identity and silence those who would defend them. Hawley's perspective is as inflammatory and intentionally confrontational as Jason Aldean's albeit expressed more articulately. But Edsall also points to arguments by Richard Reeve in his book of Boys and Men, that the emotional plight of men whose sense of self is at odds with their situation is real. He points to the massive surge of, in deaths of despair, especially suicide and overdose, among those men. Reeve also points to an increasing gender gap in educational attainment, increasingly favoring women. But also, he points out a gap in what he calls personal agency. Women are increasingly more likely to initiate life changes in a variety of ways. Solo home purchase, volunteering for public service organizations, even initiating a divorce. 
Men in America, Richard Reeves says, are drifting. Affirmative outreach by social and governmental structures, not a rollback of social progress, all of the MAGA movement, are what's needed in his view to offer them a renewed sense of inclusion. I think in particular the characters in Breaking Away of Dave's father and uh, Dave's friend Mike in large measure anticipate two modes of reacting to a sense of exclusion, condescension, and loss of agency. On the one hand, a measure of resignation and acceptance that life changes and one makes choices along the way. And on the other, a sense of rising anger in the face of what seems to be a deck stacked against you. Thomas Edsall's conclusion in looking at these competing notions of traditional male egos struggling to contend with an evolving society is to note that polling data shows that almost nothing predicts affinity with either of the two major political parties than agreement with policy propositions that enshrine traditional masculine prerogatives like military spending, gun rights, and unfettered speech in the workplace. But Edsel also notes a rise on both ends of the political spectrum of schadenfreude, right? Pleasure and the turmoil of others. It's become fair game for public figures to engage in mockery and even outright cruelty and to be rewarded for it. Now, obviously, former President Trump is the prime example of this. But I think the way, too, that inexperienced politicians on the left who offer facile, and I'll call them snarky, sound bites on social media are elevated beyond those who offer nuance and patience is every bit as telling. The whole concept of social media marketing relies on a fundamental premise that serving up content that distills and reinforces a preferred narrative about society and its ethos will increase engagement by amplifying a sense that one's moral code has been endorsed and that one is part of a like-minded and presumably large community. And breaking away, the cutters are every bit as guilty of perpetuating negative generalizations about the college students as the reverse is true. Dave, the main character, professes to have no interest in going to college even though he takes an entrance exam on his own initiative. To admit to an interest in going to college would, from his perspective, amount to a betrayal of his family and friends and an implicit rejection of the inherent worth of blue-collar labor. I mentioned the importance of the cinematic device of the underdog triumphing in an athletic competition and how breaking away leans on the cutters, okay, spoiler again, winning against all odds in the climactic bike relay race. This plot device relies at its core on an implicit feeling of validation of the personal worth of the individual or team by virtue of their defeating a seemingly superior adversary. Now I noted earlier how difficult it can be, or at least I find it, not to confer the right to organize and lead on the basis of intellectual capacity and formal education. Similarly, similarly, I find it hard not to fall prey to the urge to root for the underdog and to see competition not just as a demonstration of a level of mastery of a set of skills, but as the sort of validation of personal worth I spoke of a moment ago. So much of society reinforces the need to compete and to see victory as validation. Now, competition is as old as human society, really. And certainly it can be seen in its most benign form as a spur to personal wellness and healthy self-discipline. But in the age of Trump, winning has been ever more distorted into a literal validation of moral worth. Life is a zero-sum game and losers are worthless. I don't have an answer. But I find myself asking if I don't personally reside somewhere down a slippery slope between the ideals of, say, the Olympic movement and the so much winning ethos of Trumpism. What the Trumpian sense of victory seems to lack from my perspective is simple sportsmanship. Y yes, that's a gendered word, I suppose, 
but really we're talking about a movie largely driven by male characters wrestling with different ways of expressing masculine identity. In addition to the character Rod's acknowledgement of Mike's anger-fueled competitive drive in the quarry, he has another moment in close-up with no dialogue after Dave has come from behind to win the race Rod's team expected to win. We can see him acknowledging the supreme effort in the face of injury that Dave put forth to win. Rod appreciates the skill and dedication fueling the victory. To me, that tiny moment is one of the most important in the film. It captures an acknowledgement of the worth of a supposed adversary. In a similar sense, Dave's father's dropping of his air of disdain for his son and his willingness to drop an air of masculine detachment to comfort his son speaks of an opening to an honest relationship with another, even when you don't fully understand or support their values and lifestyle. The relationship moves from the sort of nearly satirical mocking of the dad we had in our story for all ages to an image of genuine personal parental love. Beyond that, though, is the need to start from an authentic, and self-reflective place in engaging with those one is deeply opposed to. As D.H. Lawrence once wrote, once wrote, if only people would meet in their very selves. It's telling that Dave not only drops his faux Italian mannerisms in the movie, but ultimately acknowledges that he really does want to go to college, and then does so. Finally, I find myself turning, as I so often do, to our first Unitarian Universalist principle, exhorting us to affirm the inherent worth and dignity of all persons. Too often, I think the temptation exists to limit this to giving worth to those who subscribe to a preferred moral code. But for me, our faith above all asks us to constantly examine our moral sense as it develops over a lifetime and from accumulated contact with competing ethical systems. On what basis shall we set one set of values above another? It's easy to lean on love as a transcending value. Indeed, I believe the proposed new Article 2 of the UUA bylaws enshrines love at the center of our faith. But it doesn't define love. It assumes everyone has a shared understanding of love. But do we share that understanding of that word with everyone? Can we be sure that we're speaking the same language, same language as those with whom we believe we are trying to reach an understanding? Can it be, for instance, that some reserve the word love to express, say, the most tender and precious feelings, those for partner and children? or even as an expression of a soul-deep gratitude and humble appreciation for the grace and forgiveness of a personal savior. In the end, our film, Breaking Away, expresses a sense of America, I think, as diverse and complex, and also full of opportunity, that Serbian immigrant Steve Tesic both loved and refused to oversimplify. Given that idealism and his warnings that Julie shared about the manipulation of thwarted man masculinity by cynical autocrats willing to lie, I know he would be heartsick at the picture of life in a small town proffered by Jason Aldean. It was good to watch this film and revisit a place like the declining Indiana of his screenplay and remember how it embodied a sense of community that cared and didn't fear. This affectionate but insightful film serves as a time capsule of when we were more apt to pull together than to fall apart. I invite you all now to rise as you're willing and able, embody your spirit, and join in singing our closing hymn, Give Thanks. It's number 69 in the Gray Hymnal.
fortune our friendships have brought. Give thanks for the homes with the kindness are blessed, for seasons of plenty and well-deserved rest. For our country extending from free sea unto sea, for the ways where we would hit the land of the free. Please remain standing if you would, and let's revisit that moment of connection. If you would like to take hands or touch shoulders as you're comfortable, please do so as we extinguish our chalice and I share this, I apologize, somewhat lengthy benediction. Words of Langston Hughes. Let America be the dream that dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great, strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It was never America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There has never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding the only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog of mighty crush the weak. Who made America whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain must bring our mighty dream again. Oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. We the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states, and make America, America again. Go in peace and blessings. Amen. Ashe. Blessed be.